Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, presented by Cattle, Season 5, the Canada's Food Price Report Edition. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Chalabois. Our very special guest, recorded live at the Coffee Association of Canada's Conference, live in person, is Gordon Neal, co-founder and general manager of Refine Biomass Solutions, based in Halifax. And we've got a real Atlantic uh, theme going on. We're going to continue that, actually. turning They turn spent coffee grounds into eco-conscious profits. They revolutionize quick-service coffee industry by developing technology to sustainably upcycle spent coffee grounds into food-grade ingredients, so diverting a lot. I mean, when in the interview, he was telling us about how much coffee grinds uh, there are. And, and, you know, when he says how much there is, it c- makes total sense. But it's just one of those things you don't think of. It just disappears under the know. counter, right? Exactly. Uh, no, I was surprised by the volume. So, uh, again, a great startup looking for an opportunity, reducing waste across the supply chain, uh, some upcycling going on, uh, and the company's from Halifax, too. So, yeah, yeah I was happy that uh, – that, uh, he was able to join us uh, at the uh, coffee uh, convention. Uh, that place uh, actually brings really some great guests to uh, to our podcast. Yeah, fantastic! It's great. It's great. This is a uh, that will be our last one live from. But we got we got some great uh, some great interviews, and hopefully uh, that will continue. I'm sure that'll continue next year. You you sound different to me. I know you're somewhere different. Where are you, and and what are you doing there? <laughs> I'm Berlin, Berlin lad, Berlin, Germany. First, first we take Berlin, yeah. That's Fantastic. right, exactly. Uh, so I was invited to uh, to deliver a talk, not not a keynote, but a talk uh, uh, about about uh, alternative proteins. Uh, I was actually on a panel today, so each of us had half an hour, and then there was a panel after that with the crowd, and uh, it was really interesting. So I, it was me, a scholar from Sweden, and a scholar from Singapore. Uh, where you know that um, uh, cultivated meat was actually mm-hmm. legalized uh, in 2020. So uh, great stories there. Uh, I mean, overall, it was really about uh, alternative proteins in general, not just uh, cultivated meat. Uh, we talked about insects. We talked about algae. Uh, we, talk, uh, we talked about plant-based. We talked about a lot of things. And, and of course, I brought, I brought forward a very economic view on things because uh, – as you can imagine, in the room, uh, there were about, what, 300 people? It was really mm-hmm. a nice room to, to present. Uh, most people were, I would say, probably vegetarians or, or, or vegans because uh, during meals, you couldn't find meat at all, like zero. And I didn't expect that, uh, but I'm okay with that. I, I, in fact, actually, the, the food was really good. But you can tell that – so everyone that presented, they were kind of raw, raw, raw. Let's uh, go vegan. Let's go vegetarian. The, the world should be eating meat. And, I'm, and I came in front. I listen, I'm a man. I eat meat. I love eating meat. However mm-hmm. – and then I started to kind of present some of the issues that, that we're seeing. And we've talked about this on the podcast, uh, price volatility, the price of beef, the price of pork. I mean all of these things will Small push herd, people yeah. to think differently about meat. For sure, yeah, yeah. So, Super so some people, so most people were saying, well, because of climate change, people will actually start stop eating meat. No, people won't stop stop won't stop eating meat because of climate change because they'll think that the other guy will do that for them. Uh, but if you actually ding them with mm, a higher price at the meat counter, mm. they'll that will change their behavior. Well, it's a good segue into talking about uh, the report and, and the forecast about what's going to yes. happen. But I, I, but I, I mean, we're, we're actually going to talk about cattle a little bit in a different context later on. And I was watching this report on how small, and we've talked about this, how small the, the North American herd is. I mean, the price is bound to go up. It's very small herd. Uh, so uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, Dominic LeBlanc, perhaps a distant cousin. Uh, yes. Once or 200 times removed. Uh, <laughs> uh, dined at uh, Mar-a-Lago with President Trump That's on the right. positive side. On the positive side, uh, the G7, they're the first G, uh, Trudeau's first G7 leader to kiss the ring in person. Um, I heard they had Mexican right. food, by the way. Did you hear that? I heard that. Oh, Mexican no, food. I did not. I did not actually look at the menu. Uh, <laughs> actually, is that what you heard? Had, <laughs> yeah, I, no, I think they had steak and potatoes. Now, Trump jokes about Canada as the 51st state, which makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up, and then pranks Trudeau with a picture of himself on the mountains with a Canadian flag. And here's my question to you. 
what are the Europeans thinking about all this? You're in, you're in Europe. They must be wondering if this is the energy around Canada, their neighbor, they must be wondering what's coming their way. Cause um, well, they don't, it, they don't, they don't envy us uh, for mm. sure. Cause we're stuck with our geography. We can't move Canada. Uh, they, of course, uh, Donald Trump is not well liked, but they do understand uh, the power of democracy. Uh, it is the choice of Americans to have elected someone who thinks that people in America eat dogs and cats. I mean, that's basically it. And so when they see that, they go, wow. But America is a big economy, so you want to trade with them. And uh, and as you know, Germany economically is not doing well. I, in fact, I actually had lunch with an economist from uh, from Germany here, and uh, every he, 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 he spent about 20 minutes explaining to me what was going on in Germany, and mm. you could have replaced the word Germany – with Canada. Interesting. It was really, except for the amount of immigration that they actually have received over the last decade, as you know, with Syria and of course the Ukraine, I mean, Canada's numbers and triple them basically. Of course, of course. With less space and they have 80 million people already. Yeah. So, so it's much worse for them. Mm. Well, I, you know, it's to be interesting to see what's do for us. I don't know if you saw the news over in Berlin, but uh, Trump nominated his, uh, I, I, it's not the official name, but it's, it's Tariff Czar, uh, Peter Navarro. Uh, now, this is a guy that just got out of jail, basically, for, for refusing to testify to Congress about Jan 6. He's a true Trump loyalist. I mean, I thought yes. it was going to be, uh, what's his name, um, Lighthizer, who's the expert That's on right, yeah. trade. But uh, I don't know. It feels like uh, he's going to have a real... Um, this, you know, this tw- whatever it is, some kind of tariffs, whether it's twenty five percent or not, uh, you know, is is coming our way now. What are your thoughts around countervailing tariffs on our behalf? Uh, you know, there must be a list. There was last time. Remember when the aluminum came up? We we uh, we taxed uh, Kentucky bourbon, and we taxed. I don't know if we taxed California wine, but <laughs> you know, one, two, three, four. The, the, I the see a trade tax war on, on the chicken tax on trucks uh, kind of deal. The chicken tax, yeah. Like uh, you know, you got you as an academic who studies food systems. Are you starting to turn your mind to countervailing tariffs? And and um, did it play? I I don't know if it could have played any role in the report we're going to talk about in depth, but uh, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, we did uh, did address the issue, but uh, the bottom line for us uh, this year uh, is that we don't think that tariffs aren't going to be, uh, are going to be a big factor because they're not necessarily going to happen. Uh, It's, it's really about getting uh, the attention of partners. I honestly think that so far Canada has played it right. I think it was a good thing that um, Prime Minister Trudeau flew into Florida over the weekend to meet with uh, with Donald Trump. I, I think it was really important for him to do that. I think he should have brought Doug Ford, a premier of Ontario, because if you want a good time and you want some bonhomme, as I think uh, Dominic LeBlanc described it, uh, yeah. you know. I, I, I'd, say, I, I'd say right now, uh, I would say that the, uh, the government in Canada is dealing with this appropriately. Uh, unlike Mexico, uh, which mm. uh, appears to want to escalate things a little bit, we can't afford to escalate anything. We're we're at odds with China. We're at odds with Russia. Uh, we're at odds with India. And so, uh, who's left? I mean, we we have to get along with someone. Well, uh, you know, there's definitely two schools of thought about that. One is, um, you know, what's the plan? Ontario is running ads, but Canada is not. Uh, did we arrive within hand? Some kind of okay, listen. We don't want it to get to this, but we're going to, you tariff us, we tariff you. I mean, uh, there, there's that school of thought. I think the general, okay, I went but down. I think, but I mean, the, Canadians are nervous. I mean, the, the this whole idea of the 51st state, I, I thought it was really ridiculous that it got so much attention. It was a joke. It was just a joke. I mean, you can't yeah. just say, oh, let's be, it's Donald Trump. Okay, mm-hmm. it was a joke. So I believe Dominique LeBlanc. I mean, but I do. Mm-hmm. I just don't understand why it took. Actually, it got so much attention. It was just a joke over dinner. I mean, you make jokes, yeah. I make jokes over dinner. Yeah, but when so, Trump makes jokes, uh, people who listen to him. Yeah, but I they, don't, they don't know if it's. Yeah, but uh, I honestly, you can't really take take a comment like that seriously. To be honest, yeah, I think he's pranking. I, I don't think it's a joke. I think he's now pranking Trudeau. Is what I think. Anyway, that's my personal opinion. Well, that picture, of course it is. Yeah. 
<laughs> he's pranking him. He's pranking think, him. That's not a, think that's, he thinks that Canada is in Switzerland. <laughs> well, Why don't you look at the mountains? <laughs> yeah, I know it's in the Matterhorn. You know, I, I used to have a I used to have a, a boss's boss who would stand up and get the notion of everything wrong, but the direction right. You know, he was kind of one of these. You know, when the when the Nazis invaded uh, Pearl Harbor, kind of guys. Uh, so I don't know. Anyway, I yeah, I don't even like. I don't like it even being said. And if it was just a joke at dinner, then what's that picture all about? I think he's tr- he's pranking our prime minister. That's what I think. Anyway. Oh yeah, and uh, I mean, I I would have I would have perhaps uh, pushed don't the like agenda. It. Said, well, maybe you guys, you know, the Americas like territories with like Puerto Rico. Maybe we could we could become a territory instead of a state. <laughs> And be a oh pile of garbage. Yeah, yeah. Pile, like hey, by the way, I asked him. I asked I like the Germans. It. By the way, so mm-hmm. I started my talk, and I, I'm just curious. I'm the only, I was the only Canadian in the room. Okay, so I ask. Mm-hmm. Listen, if I tell you Canada and food, what's the first thing you think? What do you think? What that was their first answer? In that room, um, canola. No dairy. Maple syrup. Maple syrup. Okay. Maple syrup. All right. Well, we're in good we're in good place with maple syrup. We got to reserve. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting. I was expecting like wheat and uh, canola, mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, because it's it's a bunch of regulators and academics. What do they know? Yeah, <laughs> but still, they're in the ag sector somewhat. You Didn't think, hear the Namo bars, and and what was really painful is, is that no one said no poutine. poutine. Nobody said poutine. They clearly didn't read your advance. Uh, I know. Your advance, your advanced team needs to do better work before you show up at these things, clearly. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get let's get to the meat of this episode, uh, Canada's Food Price Report. Yes. For once, the stars, moon. 15th anniversary. And the stars, moon, and whatever aligned so that we're actually launching it today on the podcast for the first time, because typically it's a little before or a little after. So today the, is the day this report is available. We'll put a link in the show notes, and uh, by this point, you depending on when you listen to this podcast, you've heard it about it uh, a few times. But let's go in. Let's start at what is the report. Let's spend a few minutes on that, just because we shouldn't assume everybody knows what the report is, how it's done, and and what the objectives are. And then I want to get to uh, its accuracy, because you posted, you know, are we accurate looking back at years? And then let's get to the meat of your findings. So first of all, tell, just give us an overview, the listeners an overview of what the report is and how it's, how it's created. I mean, when I created it back in, in 2009 with uh, Francis Tapon, who's uh, now retired, uh, the goal was to get people engaged in food, but most importantly, uh, it was to get people to understand why uh, prices are, are, are set as such at the grocery store. I mean, understanding that it's not just about like a grocer fixed setting prices, there are a lot of different factors. So we developed a, uh, a dashboard, which is still in the report uh, today. Every year we actually publish a, 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 um, a report. And so we, we in, in those days, we actually use econometrics, but now we've evolved. Uh, we do use econometrics, but also machine learning and AI as well. So uh, now we are, we are four universities. And uh, and each university will present to me their forecast, and then I try to to get to some sort of consensus because all models are actually are predicting something very different, mm. and that's really I think the most exciting part of the cycle is to get people to think, okay, you're you're saying vegetables are up twelve percent, but you're saying two percent. Why 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 the difference? Sure. And sure. so you kind of go through all of that. Uh, it, the process really starts. In August, uh, but it intensifies, I would say, probably early October mm-hmm. to uh, probably the second week of November. That's when things are really busy, and uh, we we have a, we get our to our final report uh, basically literally just a week before the release. So it's mm-hmm. pretty it's an intensive process. And the other thing that we do that we want to do. Uh, every year is to assess ourselves. Uh, every year, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. unlike, as you know, Michael, everyone else, oh, everyone pretty else, pretty much everybody else, yeah, because yeah, we'll we'll say this is what's going to happen next year. This is what's going to happen next year. But they never, the year after, they never go back and assess how they did uh, if it mm-hmm. actually happened. We we do that. We do that because we want to learn. We want to get better at forecasting. And forecasting, if you're into forecasting, you'll know especially when it comes to food and energy, 
uh, it is incredibly, incredibly tough. Well, I was going to say, I, I can't imagine, well, I guess I can imagine a more dynamic environment or an equally dynamic environment to do this forecast in because some of the key variables for predicting where price is going to land, obviously there's the environment, which is you know headed on a trajectory, but is uh, fairly unpredictable, but there's a trajectory there you probably build in. But what's going on with the Canadian dollar has got to be a huge, huge factor. And that that, is tied up with what's going to happen. That is probably one of the biggest factors, yeah. I got to think, right? And then what's going to happen in terms of uh, what actually happens? You know, back to the beginning of our conversation, there's a lot of talk right now. But what actually happens on the 20th uh, of January when the Trump administration actually takes takes hold is got is so dynamic so you're just gonna have to make some assumptions i mean when i talk to retailers and people it's like okay what what scenario should i plan a 69 cent dollar scenario and a and a normalization of the dollar scenario based you know there's so many moving parts putting that all together so a couple of the key drivers have got to be what you think is happening with the environment what you think is happening with the dollar tariffs where did you wind up for 2025 in terms of uh, percentage Stay the same, increase or, or decrease for Canadian. Yeah, it's 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 uh, we're forecasting an an above average year three three to five percent. So the average is one to three. So we always give ourselves a two percent window. So three to five mm-hmm. is is a lot. So for a family of four, uh, you're looking at a, a a an extra bill of eight hundred and one dollars. Uh, for a family of four on average. So it's... Uh, well, this will not come a, as good news. This will not come as good news no, to Canadian families. No, it's no, no, it's not. It's not good news. And uh, and a lot, a lot of people will say, oh, my God, uh, it's uh, it's uh, the grocers are at it again and everything else. I mean, there there is a macroeconomic context here. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, actually, I did look at some prices here in Germany and uh, prices are on the rise. Food inflation was extremely low six months ago but now and you made that up. observation uh, off microphone we were talking about pricing when you were in uh, in texas and your observation you went to some heb and some other places and said well you know it's pretty high here too right like that's right you, yeah you, it's it's right? and, and so and and by the way like in front of the crowd today i just say well you know why food prices are so high is because uh, governments are implementing uh, bad policies and grocers are, are are profiteering right and everyone laughed because <laughs> And and, and 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 you Not have true. 300 people from all over the world, Singapore, yeah. United States, uh, and so it was universal. What we went through, the blah blah boycott, everything, it's all universal. Everyone went through the same process. And if you look at headlines around the world, it was very much like that. So if you were a grocer anywhere around the world, it was not good news. Yeah. Well, I, I I think of uh, you remember in the in the peak of it all, uh, who was it? Uh, the French government wanted to put signs or care for put some signs up say, talking yeah. about shrinkflation. Like this is not an isolated Canadian phenomenon. Now there are certain dynamics that are particularly Canadian. If if um, you know if your range is is three to five higher above normal range, what's the key? Dri- are there is there a key driver? Is it a combination of things? What what is it that that you and the team identified. Well, the as number a key one category is meat. Meat products. We're expecting uh, the meat trifecta is affected by a lot of different things. Beef. Uh, I mean, the herd size is so small, uh, and that's so we're, we're we're not seeing a turning point for for beef. To be honest, uh, for 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 pork, pork was gave us a break last year. Uh, I'm not sure if you actually took advantage of that, but uh, it did. It, mm-hmm. it, it was Thank really you, stable. But we're not we're, we're expecting prices to increase. And, and chicken, poultry, uh, we're, we're concerned about the avian flu. Uh, the avian flu is actually uh, hitting okay. the United States and, and Canada as well. So we are expecting parts of Canada to be impacted. And speaking of parts of Canada, if you look at the report, you'll see that the eastern part of the country, anything... anything east of Ontario will be more impacted by food inflation than the rest of Canada. And what, say more, why is that? Well, I think it's just a matter of cycle. So for Quebec, it's, it's a cyclical thing. Uh, mm-hmm. But for the Maritimes, I think it's just, just very expensive to service. Uh, that market is really far remote. We, we trucked everything in. Nothing new about that, though, right? That's that's no. a that is there and anything food new? Food is, is more okay. expensive. I've actually lived in many parts of the country, and mm-hmm. and food is very expensive mm-hmm. in Halifax. But that's that's not. You could have said the same thing you and I five years ago. We would have said that about about Halifax. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So there's nothing new. Is there anything new in the... So A, so a uh, you've got small herds, the trifecta. Now, typically, you've told me that in the trifecta, people start to move around, you know, less beef, more chicken. Well, here's, pork, here's more chicken. the interesting thing, uh, Michael, is that the uh, typically when beef uh, really goes crazy, you'll see a higher conversion between beef and, and chicken. But now sure, we're, sure. Se- we're, we're seeing more shifting over to pork and shifting over to vegetable proteins as well. Hmm. And so, and of course today in, in Germany, I was talking about alternative proteins and, and, and the person before me, the, the scholar from Sweden, he was claiming, well, we need to change our diets to save the planet. And then I got up and I said, people won't change their diets to change the planet I, it, or to deal with climate change. They'll expect the other person to do that, but hmm. it is going to happen. People will change their diets because when they go to the meat counter, they see prices go like this. And I show them a chart of price volatility and the top 10 products at the grocery store that are most volatile in the last 10 years, guess what? It's beef and pork. And that's a killer for butchers out there. Mm. It's a killer for grocers as well. Now, you, uh, we talked about last episode, we expect uh, some commodities to actually come down, right? Olive oil looks like they've had a good season in, yeah. in uh, Spain and Greece. Uh, any 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 commodities outside the trifecta of proteins that are um that are uh, exceptionally coming high or uh, that are exceptionally going up or exceptionally going down so you want to call out what's really uh a, a relief is wheat wheat is actually under control it's at 560 a bushel us which is really that's where you want the price to be because at that price even probably it's a bit too low for farmers, but at that price, you're not compromising food affordability. And, and again, I'll repeat, wheat is 20% of all calories consumed on earth. It's a big deal. Mm. But when you look at mm. uh, products that are becoming more expensive, uh, I got to tell you, so in order, uh, I would say um, chocolate, coffee, orange juice, um, and, and beef, I would say those are the top four. Uh, and, uh, particularly with coffee, I don't know if you're, I know you're a dr- coffee drinker, but mm-hmm. I got to tell you, this is not good. Last week, coffee reached a 47 year high and wow. I wouldn't be surprised uh, uh, that if, if coffee actually reached a, uh, uh, a, a new record within the next three to four months, just because of what's going on in Brazil, yields are lower. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. it's harder to actually grow Arabica beans cause you need a perfect uh, weather pattern. And so I do think that it's going to be problematic for, for coffee drinkers for a while. And, and, and you can, you can always forward buy for a while, but coffee prices have actually been up since, uh, f- since for, for more than a year now. And so, yeah. so a lot of companies that afford bought, but now you can't, uh, you just have to renegotiate your contracts. It's going to catch up with you. Well, all I could say is if uh, the listeners hadn't heard of or uh, listened to our interview with uh, Ed from Atomo Coffee, which is yes. a blend of his uh, sustainable uh, coffee, one of his uh, one of his rationales for being so enthusiastic about the future of the company is that uh, we can manage that price. The ingredients are uh, very manageable. We'll put a link. I he, I've tried the coffee. Actually, he sent me bags, and actually sent some bags to some friends of mine. I thought you tried it at, uh, in Toronto when we met. We did, we did, but it was kind of like you know I didn't have it brewed the way I like it exactly. Like I wanted right. a, a real. This is how I'm going to enjoy a cup of coffee, and uh, it's good. Pouch, it's the good pouch. Coffee. Actually, I'm going to open. I'm, I'm going to open the pouch if I run out of coffee. I'll tell you, it's it's, it's uh, breaking case of an emergency. I think that's that's <laughs> that's that kind of coffee. <laughs> well, well, the I emergency like is a 47 year high in pricing coffee. There you go. There's your emergency. Well, when right I when I you. when I'm home and I get up in the morning, and so of course I'm the first one up in the morning in the house. Uh, I, mm. I love to grind the coffee and wake everyone up. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're funny all right anything else you want to call out about the report and i would encourage everybody like i said we're going to put a link in the show notes but there's a lot of commentary just about food systems and and directions it's not just like a numbers spreadsheet report it's it's always i find uh you know very well written any any other commentary you want to add before we uh, before we move well, on? well every year we pick a topic uh, as a group mm-hmm. to uh to raise awareness and, and this year we actually picked uh northern communities and food up north 
and food insecurity. So we actually have a page on that in the report because we know, I mean, the market reach for that report is last year was over 700 million people, if you can believe it. It's red. Mm. It's red. And of course, this week I'm testifying at Senate. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm back, baby. Yeah. <laughs> what did you so, know? Is, did Michael? that just come up? I don't remember. I don't remember yeah. you and I talking about you testifying because you're, so you're still in Europe, I, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm going to be in Europe, and uh, and so tomorrow I'm actually on December fifth. I'm testifying with David Dodge uh, to mm. kind of express our concerns about the the GST holiday, and so I my so in it it's in its third reading at Senate right now. Pretty far down the pipe. I mean, it passed through pretty. You know, it passed through. I think There's everyone some actually expects about... it to go through, but I suspect that the Senate wants to register concerns and they're 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 using ex experts to come in and mm. and you know explain that uh, there's there's some issues there so it's going to be really interesting to 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 see how things unfold i my guess is i i don't know i i don't think it's going to actually be voted down mm -hmm. but it is a ridiculous measure i mean it's it's all about politics mm. and uh, and uh but for the long mm. term it, optics aren't good. I mean, it's 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 only going to hurt mm. people. If you actually can do the math, it's going to hurt people. Now, the Senate doesn't get wildly active, but they have been recently, right? They recently put amendments in that sent the dairy. I guess, yeah, absolutely. Right? With 282, I showed up. Uh, and uh, actually, that was my last testimony, so second in a row with Senate. And I love mm -hmm. Senate. I just love it. They just they ask you questions because they want to understand. They're not, they're not weaponizing your answer to actually, mm -hmm. you know, shove uh shove your answer uh, up uh up uh, another MP's up your nose. face or something yeah <laughs> or whatever yeah, exactly yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so the senate is really about genuine interest which is great mm. so it's going to be an hour uh it's going to be an hour well spent with them uh i just don't i don't i won't have time to write a an opening statement so i'm just going to go on log in and say don't do it <laughs> well, I know, I know what uh, I've heard. David Dodge's comments. He's similarly like you're giving away money you don't have kind of perspective. Well, he's looking uh, at. Well, he's a former banker, so he's uh, well, mm -hmm. he's the Bank of Canada uh, the governor, obviously. So you'll look at yep. this. I, I'm I'm strictly food. I'm, I can only just talk about food, and and from a food perspective, especially in retail, I I just to save five bucks over two months. Like seriously, mm -hmm. you're actually asking grocers to do a lot of work for for little benefit. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to actually take advantage tomorrow, uh, to have a conversation about taxing food. I hate it. Mm. I hate it. I think it's immoral. Newfoundland decided to tax soda last year or two years ago. Uh, and revenues are up. What, people are consuming. I was going to say what happened with that? Like did people suddenly cut back so, on drinking soda? So the Which first was the intent, right? That's why they, yeah, the first it. fiscal to... year, they actually raised $8 million. Yeah, uh, I believe around that sum. Now they're up to twelve million dollars, which means more was bought, more soda was yeah. bought. A, a moralist state mm. imposing taxes to discourage people to consume does not work. It's a regressive tax. You're penalizing mm. the poor. Find something else: education, awareness, anything. Well, and your stance has been, I think, since day one of this podcast, since you and I have been talking about this, is, is take, you know, talk to those committees that decided, you know, six donuts are a treat and seven plus is a meal or something and just take <laughs> GST off of these, you know, these things. Well, here's that, the, the other thing about, about the, the GST with, uh, with restaurants. Mm -hmm. I, I got to tell you, you're, you're from Ottawa. Guess what's mm -hmm. going to happen in Ottawa for two months? Quebecers are going to go to Ottawa for lunch, mm. dinner. Mm. You're going to save. Mm. You're going to save ten percent because the PST, the provincial sales tax, remains in Quebec. They don't have an harmonized tax in Ontario. It goes mm. to zero. So mm -hmm. I don't think that restaurants in Gatineau are pretty happy about this. Mm. Well, uh, let's see. I mean, let's see what happens uh, around the testimony. I think a lot of work has already been done. And a lot of expeditions have already been built, with, like it or not. And among you, you know, you mentioned among the, all the work that has to be done at retail. Well, that work's probably almost done. So uh, of course, you know, it's, it's a little, December fourteenth. A little late in the day, right? Yeah, I know. Um, anyway.
Oh, well, anyway, it's well, late in the day, and they and for the first time, this is my 26th appearance in Ottawa, in Ottawa, uh, quote mm-hmm. unquote. And Ottawa, uh, guess, this is the yeah. first time I was invited, like within 36 hours. I've never seen that before. Hmm. So that's got your spidey senses tingling, <laughs> I, I guess we could say. Um, I think it's an right, well, attempt let's... to squash the bill, but I don't think they're, yeah. it, it, it'll be successful. No. Mm-mm. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so interesting. Like I said, I think I've said it twice already. I'll say it for the third time. We'll put a link uh, to the report into the show notes. Canadians can expect to spend more on food, uh, unfortunately. So we'll be talking about that next year and what people's choices are. But uh, for now, let's uh, let's uh, take a break from the news. Uh, let's hear from our great presenting sponsor, Cattle. who has got lots of interesting things to present if you're a retailer listening and, and consumer about your feedback. And then we'll get to our interview with Gordon Neal. And then we'll get to uh, farting cows and what we can do about it. <laughs> yeah. Does your digital customer engagement strategy need a serious upgrade? Enter Cattle, Canada's consumer insights powerhouse with the largest, most active panel of everyday shoppers. They're not your typical sponsor. They're the voice of the consumer, always in the know on the hottest trends and shaping what's next. So why Cattle? They go beyond consumer insights. They're trailblazing the future of ratings and reviews and leading the charge in user-generated content with unmatched syndicated receipt data and the ability to gather reviews across any category. Cattle partners with giants like Walmart, Canadian Tire to deliver results that count. Visit askcattle.com now for an exclusive The Food Professor podcast listener discount on your first review or research campaign today. That's askcattle.com. Well, today we're at the coffee conference and we have a, another great guest joining us, Gordon Neal, a co-founder of uh, Biomass Solutions Incorporated out of Halifax. So Fellow we're meeting, Haligonian. We're meeting in Toronto, yeah. but we're both from Halifax, <laughs> yeah. of course. From sea to shining sea. <laughs> That's right. Welcome. Thank Welcome you. to our podcast. Yeah, it's about time. I, I think we met uh, the first time uh, a while back and thought, well, I really enjoyed your story because you were presenting that day and yes. I thought, that's a company I want to talk to. Yeah. So I'm happy that you were able to join us today for for the show. So uh, so why are you here? Talk to us about the, the company a little bit and why are you here at the coffee conference? Well, most of the customers that we would want to work with are in the, are, are in the room today. Mm. So there are companies like Tim Hortons and McDonald's and Starbucks and people like that. And uh, and you are working with some already. Oh, yes. Yeah. All, all, all pretty much. Uh, some to a greater degree than others. Yeah. But, but we also want to work with smaller uh, brands uh, because... Sometimes those smaller brands are more agile and can be early adopters of new technology, and they might find favor in the marketing capability that we provide to them to show a sustainability profile, which is far improved over the current practices. And when you say smaller, uh, everybody's smaller than McDonald's and Starbucks. Yes. So what, what does that mean? Like, what's a, is, do you, do you like buy, what's practical? Like, buy, you got to have a, a dozen locations or something. What's practical to yeah, work with you? A dozen. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. A dozen would be good. Like, we're working with a, a little brand in Ottawa called Happy Goat Coffee. Um, there's, there's lots of little brands mm. out there that mm-hmm. have, you know, a dozen or 15 or 20 stores. Oh, yeah. And then upscale from that would be people like Robbins. Sure. Up from that would be Second Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. they just go up and up and up. Up and up and up. So so what is your business? You're mostly B2B. So this is yeah. a – you serve uh, directly to the food service business, the coffee makers. So what's the, uh, what's the offer you got? We were talking off mic about it. It's pretty interesting. You kind of turn – like, Sylvan, you and I have talked to upcycling companies before, yep. like at Seattle. Yeah. Um, but they were more focused, it felt, on consumer – like repackaging and then getting it into a bag and selling it back. But yeah. I don't think that's your deal. Tell, tell yeah. us about your deal. Yeah. Our deal is focused on <clears throat> a couple of things uh, for the big brands or any brand. But right now, uh, a couple of stats. You know, we drink two and a quarter billion cups of coffee a day globally. That amounts to 60,000 tons, which is a super ship worth of spent coffee every day on the planet. In Canada, it's 80 tractor trailer loads a day hmm. of this material goes to the dump. Where it emits a meth- day, a day, 80 tractor trailer loads. Wow, it's insanity. Um, and what we we uh, my co-founder and I, he's a chemical engineer. His name's Quinn. Uh, Quinn looked at this problem and he said, "This is ridiculous. Like, we're 
tearing apart the environment. So it emits, I mean, food waste, as Sylvain, you guys know, it, when it goes to landfill, it emits methane 28 times over 100 years, but 80 times over 20 years worse than CO2. So the, the math goes like this. For every kilogram of coffee waste that goes into landfill, about a kilogram, it's actually 0.89 kilograms, goes up in CO2. That's not good. And so we've got a warming planet. We've got a shortage of food. Those are big challenges. So our company is focused on having an impact on that waste stream and also impacting food supply. So what most people don't realize, when you brew a cup of coffee, over 99% of the mass of the coffee goes in the dump. Less than 1% goes Mm. in the cup. It's the most wasteful thing in the world. If If we did that with corn... You know, grew corn, shipped it all over the planet, dumped a bit of water on it, and then threw it all. People would say, that's ridiculous. And coffee is the second most valuable commodity on the planet Earth behind crude oil. Mm. Come on, I didn't know that. Swear to God. Yeah. It's it's worth more than gold. Mm. Yeah. And so... Here we are. We spend so there's a, gold in them there grounds. And that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what. So what we're doing is kind of giving coffee grounds a second life. So coffee grounds are really food. You just can't eat it. Like if you put a handful in your mouth, you'd spit it out. That's right. But it's 14% protein. A steak is like 23. Mm. There's a ton of good fiber, like good, healthy pro- prebiotic fiber in it. There's minerals, iron. There's antioxidants. It's good food. And we throw it out. It's yeah. crazy. It's ridiculous. So what we've done is we've developed technologies and patented them that enable us to preserve this material, which otherwise would be waste, and we don't like the word waste. We call it side stream. That's right. Um, but we preserve that so that it never becomes waste, because once it's waste, you can't even feed it to flies. Right? Mm-hmm. The CFIA won't let you. That's right. So, so we, we never let it become waste in the store. So we've developed patented technology, appliances, if you will, that we put into these stores, and instead of dumping the brew basket or the espresso puck into the trash... And we all see that when we go to get every day. coffee. Yeah. Every day. And, and the people who do it despise it. Like The clerks and the baristas hate throwing this stuff out because they see how wasteful it is. Mm-hmm. And they're generally young folks, and they generally care. And so... They, they would generally say, there must be a better way. Exactly. And that's what my 25-year-old partner, engineer, said. There's got to be a better way. And so we... That's, like, what, that's like, Quinn. That's Quinn Cavanaugh, yeah. yeah. Like, like, what was the epiphany, though? Like, someone of your talents and your partner's talents could tackle a whole bunch of different things. You're not like a coffee guy. You didn't grow up a coffee guy. Hell no. You were a supply chain guy, right? <laughs> you know how things move around. Yep. Uh, what Was there some kind of epiphany as you had the idea? or the two of you had the idea? Where did, what was the genesis of that? Well, it's funny how things evolve. Right? When we started this, the first thing we did was made composites out of the coffee. So it was like a filler, and we, and we put it with a binder. And we made a coffee table, a literal coffee table <laughs> out of coffee waste, which was really cute. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. People thought that was great, but how many coffee tables are you going to buy? And we wanted to have an impact, a sustainable mm-hmm. impact on this waste stream. And so we, we started playing around, and we looked at extraction of oils because there's good oil in there that's got high value. We looked at all kinds of other purposes for the material. But we said, if we're really going to have an impact, it's got to be something that people eat. Mm. They use it mm. every day. And you don't have to, you know, this is the part Savannah, that I found most interesting. And it's not something you've got to truck around. Because once you start moving that, like I, I, I think you could put coffee grounds in gardens, for example. Yes, and, they and do. For gardens, yeah. Right? Yeah. But yeah. then you've got to get it out of these places and to somewhere to get processed or packaged that's or whatever. Right. And that's, that's the, the thing. That's, that's the work. That's well, that's the, the work. And that's that, intensive. That, and it probably just, you know, zeroes out any benefit. It did. Right? We, and we tried that. So early days, and Sylvian would know some of the shops we did this with, but we went out to 10 coffee shops in Halifax and said, look, what are you doing with your waste? And they said, we're throwing the trash. And we said, would you give it to us? Sure. What are you going to do with it? Well, we're going to make food out of it. Yeah. Really? <laughs> like, they couldn't believe that. And they were so excited. I've been build, building companies for 45 years. I'm an old guy. And I, I've sold and done business development my entire career. I never sold anything as easy as this in my life to coffee shops. They Sells know itself. Yeah. They know yeah. it's waste. They don't like throwing away. It saves them money, too, actually, right? Because they've got to dispose. Somebody's got to go right. pick all that stuff yeah. up, right? Yeah. So they pay quite dearly 
to tra- to throw this material in the waste. And so waste management firms charge three three hundred fifty dollars a ton to truck this stuff away. Well, the, the funny part is it's three quarters water, mm. so they're paying to throw away water. water. So we, what well, the epiphany came to your uh, question, Michael, is the epiphany was we can make food out of this. And so the very earliest days when we collected from these coffee shops, the 10 of them in Halifax, we took the material, dried it, uh, processed it a bit, and in a commercial kitchen, we turned it into baked brownies, chocolate brownies. And we took those brownies back to the same 10 stores the next morning with a clean pail to collect today's stuff in, and they sold them. And the public loved the story. They, they sold out all the time. The stores loved it because they were getting rid of their waste and had a, and was a new product. It, was it labeled that uh, yep. it was upcycled? Uh, yes. It, and people just didn't mind? They liked it. Well, I actually tasted, because uh, you brought in Ottawa some products, correct? Yes, I did. And yeah. I tasted it, and it was great. Yeah. It was awesome. We, we just went through a, uh, a series of um, sensory testing, like a, with uh, Canada's Martin's Kitchen. With PKI consumers, did yeah, yeah. And so we had a 60-person panel. Uh, we did a, a triangular taste test, it's called. Oh, yeah. And uh, when we substituted in a, in a chocolate cookie, when we substituted 50% of our kafika ingredient for cocoa, there was no discernible difference by the panel. And so, you, so zero. You, I think that's the first time. Zero you, discernible difference. You've called it Kafika. I think that's the first time. Yeah. That's your brand name. Our brand the, name for the ingredient is Kafika. Kafika. We've, we've Kafika. trademarked it in Canada. Not and the named US. after Kafka, but nope. Kafika. Kafika, okay. yeah. I like it. Okay. A fika is a break in Sweden where you sit down and have a coffee and a sweet hmm. uh, over a social it's, engagement. It's, it's brandable. It's really That's easily nice. brandable, nice. yeah. Kafika. Yeah, well, like as a, as a business-to-business brand, it's a bit of a mouthful for a well, consumer it's a, brand. I, I suspect you kind of merge cocoa and coffee. Yeah, and so it's, it's a cafe in Europe is, yeah. is, 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 is spelled K-A-F-E. Maybe, K-A-F-E. You're a, yeah. maybe you're a fan of Kafka the writer too, the bizarre no, writer, maybe. Yeah. No, no, okay. no, that's not that's working. For <laughs> so, so you you you're um, in the stage of the development of where you're at. Yep. If, if if it's a baseball game, where are you at? Like, what inning are you in? Do you uh, we're running from third to home. Okay. All okay. right. So we've got wow. appliances built. Ready? They're being tested in stores right now, and some big brands that you guys would know. You'd plug this appliance into uh, like some electricity or yep. something, right? Yeah. And what we've done, it, w- this was a very complicated uh, problem that required a pretty complex solution. You know, we had to get into the food business, and we're not a food company. Mm. We had to build hardware and appliances, and and, mm. and get approvals and, and for and all, all and all that stuff. And so we had all, it, it, in order to be fully circular, which is what we are. You know, we're taking waste out of the food stream or out of the waste stream avoiding greenhouse gases using technology to upcycle it into food and then putting it back into the food space so we had to play in a lot of you know sandboxes to get this right mm-hmm. uh, and so a lot of people say oh my gosh that's complicated and it was you know it's, it's interesting though so i've come to appreciate the ecosystem for food and new innovation in the maritimes atlantic provinces halifax right that there's a lot of people working on very innovative things in your part. Oh, absolutely. Your part of the country. Yeah. So if you if you have one of your devices in your coffee shop, yep. Um, what happens then? So what happens is the the, the barista, the the clerk, uh, yeah. instead of dumping the material from the from the espresso puck or the brew basket into a trash can, they dump it into our patented appliance, which is a food grade stainless steel appliance. It collects. We call it a kafika collector. Uh, and then when the when the pail sort of that it go, the receptacle that it goes into is full, you can no longer use the appliance. It stops working, so it's dummy proof. And then you take that receptacle about six steps into the kitchen. It goes into our second appliance, which we call like a fika dryer. And in there, we remove all of the water. So it's seventy like dehydrator, basically. It, yeah, but it's well, it's a pretty sophisticated dehydrator. So drying technologies scale up really nicely but they don't scale to miniaturize at all easily and so oh. so what we've created is actually patentable for other uses and we've done that um, like why wouldn't you have this as a consumer brand for the home well we've talked about that but is, but is it that we, issue it's hard to scale it down to the- well partly but it's it's also it, 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 you got to have enough volume to justify i mean a household would actually make your household your your kids go through a lot of coffee 
Well, yes, but we make one pot of coffee a day. Mm. I mean... Pots of coffee would you need to make to actually make it worthwhile? So a typical quick service store of big brands that you'd know, like Duncan or Tim's, they're generating 60 to 100 kilograms of this waste every day, day, every store. That's a green bin. How how much kilos of uh, kafika can you get get out of that? 25%. So if it's 100 kilograms... It's 25 grams. It's 25 kilograms. 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 And so what our appliance does, Michael, to answer your question is the appliance... It leaves the paper filters in because you can't take those out when they're hot and wet and sticky because they're too dirty. So we've managed to build technology where we can leave the papers in. We remove all the water. It's deposited in a food grade pail, like a you know, a, a, with a cover on it. And now it's a it's still food, right? So then what we do is we figured out logistically a way to get that aggregated, big big volumes, very inexpensively. And then we put it through our processing plant and turn it into food. And so mm. we're, we're currently feeding, you know, we've got, we've got our kafika powder, which is now a cocoa uh, extender or a substitute uh, that goes in baked goods or chocolate products. But there's also an animal feed angle to this. So there's so much of the material. I just told you, 80, 80 tractor trailer loads a day. Mm. That's a lot of stuff. And so you've got to have big markets, and we're not the cocoa market is not going to you know, absorb all this right away. So we've uh, done feeding trials on cattle. It turns out that cows like this stuff. They do. Yeah. Wow. But uh, but a really interesting one. I don't know. You you, you may know. You probably do know about this. I think uh, Sylvia. Uh, the black soldier fly larvae. Do you know that? Yes. Guy? Okay. So Michael, he, he, Michael's got a weird look on his face. The hell? <laughs> what are you talking about? So you remember the cricket craze? Uh, cricket protein. We talked about it in an episode uh, a couple right. of, a couple of times back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a friend of ours is a guy named Greg Wanger. He's in Halifax. He's got a company called Oberlund AgriScience. And what what this black soldier fly larvae is kind of cricket to the power of two. So. This is a little critter that's not a pest, according to the CFIA and the FDA. He doesn't carry disease. He doesn't bite. doesn't do anything bad. Uh, but what he does do, uh, when the egg becomes a larvae, he grows 8,000 times his mass in 10 days. So it's the equivalent of a, a newborn infant child mm. becoming the biggest of great blue whales in 10 days. The yeah. incredible hulk of the food business. Yeah, and, yeah. All, and all they do is eat, <laughs> and they'll eat food waste. Uh, but you, gotta ha- you can only feed them clean food waste approved by CFI. CFI. And so it just so happens that in trials with black soldier fly larvae, they like coffee too. Now, we don't know why, but, but they do. And so what happens there is in 10 days, they harvest those larvae. They're about 55% protein, dry weight. So they're great food for salmon, especially because salmon like flies. Uh, but... But they're also great food for chickens and other poultry, pet foods, pets, pet foods pets. dogs and cats. Ah. Yeah, and so the, the, it, we have a, 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 an arrangement with that company now that they're going to take virtually all the material we can give them. And there's these black soldier fly farms. There's one here in Ontario. There's one in the West. They're all over Europe. They're growing up in the states. It's the, the globe needs more protein. And this is an inexpensive way to get it from food waste. Man, mm. I learned so much on this podcast. This is one of my there favorite parts. Uh, listen, um, this has been great. Yep. Uh, if people want to learn more and get in touch with you. Well, can I add we'll ask one more oh, yeah, question? Yeah, sure. So what's next for you? Uh, what's next for the company? Uh, Scaling, yeah. the hard part. So we've proven everything works. We've, land, you know, we've done our patents. We've lined up arrangements with customers. Yep. And... You know, we have a partner in uh, SureShot Solutions. Do you know them out of Lower Sackville? No, no. So if you, SureShot's an amazing company, and it just so happens, like, of all the places on the planet they could be, they're seven kilometers down the road from us. Sackville, <laughs> it's just outside of Halifax. And and uh, what they do is uh, if you go into, like, a Tim's or a McDonald's and order a double-double, they their technology dispenses the cream and the sugar and the sweetener of the milk in exactly the right proportion to get you their double double every day. Hmm. So it's a forty year old company founded by a fellow named Mike Duck in Halifax. They've installed these appliances in one hundred and thirty five thousand restaurants. They're in every single Tim's globally. They're in most North American McDonald's. They're in all the Dunkin' Donuts stores. They're our manufacturing service and delivery partner, so that we can scale quickly. Mm. So that's our next challenge. So we're we're 
we're anxious but also afraid to get a PO from one of these big brands. What do you do? What do you do? What do, you do a fundraising round like yeah. your private? Yeah, we've, we've raised thing? we've raised about two and a half million in the last couple of years okay. um, to get this thing going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, a startup that's rapidly scaling like we are needs a lot of money, mm-hmm. uh, and and you need it fast. So we we you know we're forever out there looking at okay when, when's the next raise coming, and we've got one yeah, planned yeah, yeah. right now. But right. but yeah, the next challenge is you know. Uh, proving to the to the to those brands that this is a viable solution, and then getting a contract with one of them and going crazy. Man, this, that's awesome. Well, listen, congratulations on yeah, all your success so far. So many great stories coming out of yep. the Atlantic region and, and kind of innovation. It's fantastic. Yep. Yep. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, are you a LinkedIn guy? Or yeah, I'm a LinkedIn way? guy. Yeah. So it's uh, Gordon Neal, Refined Biomass. Uh, no E in refine, R-F-I-N-E. Right. And uh, the website is refinedbiomass.com. Fantastic. Well, listen, Excellent. on behalf of uh, Savannah and I, thanks so much for joining us here at the Coffee Conference, at the Coffee Association of Canada Conference. My pleasure. Uh, here in, uh, in Mark. It was great to meet you. And, we'll and see uh, you again next year. Yeah. Who knows? Well, you're going to see me sooner than that now. <laughs> okay, absolutely. We're, we're going to have a coffee. And perhaps a beer. Well, that too. But yeah. we're at a coffee conference, so I said coffee <laughs> exactly, first. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, listen, uh, safe travels back home and uh, continued success. Thank you very much, Michael. Take care. Thanks. All right. So like I said, I was shocked when Gordon was giving us those statistics about how many grounds were created. And it seems like this, uh, not a problem to be solved, but it does seem like they're onto something. Um, you know, again, once again, like I said, you gotta the top, wonder, I mean, you have to wonder why someone else didn't think about this before. I mean, Seriously. Well, I, I think the I think the the the, the ingenious part of it is, uh, you know, moving spent coffee grounds around is doesn't make a lot of sense from all the many places. But, you know, their technology seems to be anyway, wishing the best of luck. It's another great interview uh, from the uh, from the East Coast, which, by the way, we got another fantastic interview coming up next week uh, from the East Coast. Another amazing uh, Halifax based uh, East Coast uh, organization. That's a bit of a teaser, but uh, that'll yep. be ne- that will be our guest uh, next yes. week. Let's talk about you did this. Uh, you did this interesting post about uh, farting cows and a food ingredient. I, I, it went viral. Or eh? supplement. Well, you it's know funny I, because it you made know me why think. I wrote the column on the plane. Why? Okay. <laughs> on the yeah. on my flight over here in Germany. Yeah. What am I going to write about? Farting cow. You know, it made you know what it made me think about. I think the I guy next to me inspired me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yee. Um, you know, it, it 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 reminded me of way back in the day. Um, Ronald Reagan said something about how much farting cows were contributing to the you know the, the climate problem, and everybody well, made keep fun in mind, of them. We're talking farts because I wanted to to make it fun a little bit, but it's actually burps. Burps are the problem when it comes to methane, by the way. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, see there. Now I've learned uh, something. It's so, the other okay, hole. So, it's the other hole. It's because it's, of the it's stomachs. <laughs> It's the other end. And well, all right. So enough of my nonsense. Take us through uh, what no, you're but thinking it, about. I, misle- what's, what's I misled sold you, but I, on purpose, because I, I thought it was when I was writing my column, it was I thought it was going to be more fun to talk about farts. So that's all. And uh, yeah, and, I mean, and it did. It's always it did. fun to talk about farts, but by the way, listen, yeah, sure. this is Buttergate uh, in the making all over again. Uh, I when I saw that. Uh, so this drug, this uh, this uh, this uh, this. Uh, Feed uh, was approved by uh, the CFI back in February, I believe, and the idea is to reduce methane emissions coming from livestock. Essentially, if you give them, if you give cattle and dairy cows this uh, this additive, uh, they are going they, they they will reduce their their uh, burps uh, by sixty percent uh, allegedly, okay. but. Okay. Uh, and of course, I knew it in February, but I didn't think much of it to be honest. And uh, over the last, I'd say, couple of months, people have been—they've been actually poking me. So, let's, did you know about this? Did you know about this? Uh, do you have a problem with that? And then I went, well, yes, I have a problem with that because again, consumers don't know what's going to happen. And the additive actually was—it was deemed safe, but that's not the problem. Uh, again, going back to the Buttergate case. Uh, but again, it was approved and, uh, and farmers, uh, were using palm mite to increase, uh, butter fat content and everything else. Uh, but it did impact the quality of the butter. In this case, it may, 
it may impact the quality of, of the meat. It may mm. impact, again, the quality of dairy products. And so there's, there's been zero assessment. And so, and, and of course, you can tell uh, some people on, on, on social media, they're very upset with what's happening because they, they're, they're, they're caught off guard. They're, they feel blindsided. So that's certainly not something you want to see. And <clears throat> I'm just concerned that we're not learning from our, from my past, mm. uh, for our past mistakes. Well, that's the show for this week. I'm Michael LeBlanc, Consumer Growth Consultant, Media Entrepreneur, and you are? And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Chalabois. All right, everybody. Safe travels. Take care. <laughs>